Welcome to the STR Data Lab. Hello and welcome to another edition of the STR Data Lab. I'm Jamie Lane, Chief Economist at AirDNA, and I'm joined again with my trusty co-host, Scott Sage. Scott, it's Final Four. It's Eclipse time. Uh, it feels like it's a big time for short-term rental data and analysis. I am honored to be sharing the microphone with Mr. Eclipse himself, Jamie Lane, <laughs> who went viral last week with his wonderful analysis of the Eclipse data on an impact of short-term rentals. So we finally made it. It's the big day. Do you have glasses to celebrate? I do. I'm, as we are recording, and those of you that are hearing this, you'll, uh, you can't tell that I just put on my Eclipse It's a good plug glasses. for our YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, but we, we're recording now uh, about two hours before the start of the Eclipse on, on Monday. Uh, as Scott uh, alluded to, we did go viral last week with uh, some amazing visualization of the eclipse sort of uh, impacting short-term rental occupancy. We'll link to the uh, tweet uh, in the comments if you hadn't seen it. But really great how sort of short-term rental data sort of captured the imagination of really people around the world. That, that's right. I, I would imagine a lot of people who had no idea even what a short-term rental was saw that data. I think more of that to come as our team's looking at finding creative ways to elicit short-term rental data in unique visualizations. And so if you're listening to this and you have an idea or you have a question about some data you want to see, send it our way. So talking about data, uh, we did some fun analysis around, and I think actually actionable analysis because there's there's not much you can actually do with a, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a fun visualization of uh, uh, Eclipse data. Uh, but what we're also trying to get into is actionable analysis for you to actually learn how to make your units more profitable. And Scott, we talk about analysis that you maybe like and, may, and maybe dislike. Digging into what can I actually do to increase the performance of my properties is a type of analysis I just love because it's actionable, it's understandable, uh, and you can actually go out and make a change to your property and see the net benefit from that and like calculate a return on investment and like actually dive in. And so that's my sort of prelude to saying we're talking about amenities today and what is the impact that you can get from performance on adding uh, these amenities to your properties or investing in properties with these type of amenities. And there's a spectrum here, Jamie. I think that's what's exciting about this. You, you hit the nail on the head. This is actionable analysis and insights we're providing here. And this is analysis that anybody listening to this can go do. You can go into the RDNA app. You can do this yourself. And so we're going to walk through how you can do that towards the end of this episode. But there's a sliding scale here, depending upon you know, capital requirements or capital availability between how you can upgrade your listing with different amenities and the impact that it could drive. So why don't we dive in? Yeah. So maybe I'll just start with and sort of the blog that we did and uh, some of the uh, sort of high level takeaways that we got from uh, from that blog. So, and we'll have it linked in the in the show notes below. Uh, but essentially, what we wanted to say I and mean, help people understand is of the sort of most common amenities out there. Uh, so, think I mean, pools, hot tubs, kitchens, heating and air, uh, having available parking, um, having a gym things like that, um, what uh, amenities and knowing that this really can vary substantially by city, by location type, what is the lift that you actually get in terms of either occupancy or ADR uh, from adding that amenity? And th that then that can help you sort of dive in a bit further on what is the ROI of adding that amenity uh, to your property? And Jamie, can you debrief the methodology a bit here? Because we did compare like-for-like -like properties within markets and across the U.S. for each of these amenities. Yeah, so uh, that's what we started with. I'm trying to uh, 
remove as many sort of factors as possible that could impact this type of analysis. Because and in reality, being a data scientist economist that I am, like to control for actually like what the impact of each amenity is, like you need to do a sort of mass- massive regression model. You need to try to and create coefficients for each amenity and what that impact is takes a ton of data and cleaning analysis. And then it actually ends up being a bit more complicated to actually interpret the results to as you're digging into out- output files from Stata or R. So what we try to do is like the simplified version of that uh, regression analysis. So let's get down to just entire home properties that were available full time, limit the analysis analysis to just three bedroom properties, uh, and then systematically go through and essentially analyze properties with and without each of those amenities. Uh, and for the vast majority of amenities, this type of analysis works pretty well. That said, um, it's not going to be perfect. Uh, there are some amenities that actually correlate with other things about the properties. Uh, and a good example of that is like being pet friendly or not, which is sort of seen as a very popular amenity. We definitely see an occupancy lift from being pet friendly. But if you just look at the average rate of properties with and without being pet friendly, it would make you think that there's actually an ADR hit, like that you get a lower ADR for being pet friendly. And that's not necessarily the case. It's actually that most luxury properties really higher end, high ADR properties just don't allow by rule uh, pets in their properties. So when you look at the analysis, it's like, oh, it doesn't look like being pet friendly is a good thing for my rates. When in reality, if you, and you'd have to control for so much to actually get to the impact, but we do show that it has a positive sort of overall impact on, on occupancy, which I mean, by adding are being pet friendly. That's really what you're trying to boost is like, I'm going to get more people in my home uh, by allowing them to bring their pets than not. So I would definitely take a look at the results when you're eyeing it with an eye of like, what is the uh, uh, sort of takeaway here? The major ones like pool, hot tub, and you're going to get a difference. Actually on occupancy, it's not, re- it doesn't end up being a big difference. But there you see the big uh, uh, delta on ADR. So like if you've got a pool and you're going to see a significant higher ADR uh, that you're able to get and charge because people want to book your property with a pool and those that have a pool are charging a premium for it. A a lot of this analysis leads to some trade-off decision making. Like you think about the pet friendly. Are you going to want to put up with cleaning the fur and and potentially maybe some other left left behind belongings from the from the pets to drive increased occupancy, maybe depending upon the market. And, and that analysis will be required. But let's maybe focus, Jamie, on some of the more prominent amenities. What I mean by that is I heard you say earlier, heat and air conditioning, maybe Wi-Fi or a kitchen. To a certain degree now, those are just table stakes. Very rarely is anybody filtering out Wi-Fi or filtering for Wi-Fi because what we see is 99% of properties have this. So why don't we keep our uh, conversation focused, maybe three key categories around pools, hot tubs, and then what we saw emerge is washer and dryer as as the third. So let's start with pools. And what do we see from an amenities lift standpoint with pools? Yeah. Well, again, it depends on location. Uh, (laughs) uh, So, uh, and we sort of broke it out by our six location types that I think a lot of people have sort of heard me talk about in the past. So urban, suburban, mountain, coastal, small town, uh, and rural. And and there you see, like, let's talk about pool in particular. Pools drive a significantly higher ADR boost in large urban areas. And honestly, that's where they're a bit more unique. So you get to sort of on the coast, a lot of properties have pools. You also have the beach right there. The ADR impact from a um, a pool, I mean, let's say for uh, coastal destinations, it, it gets you about twenty percent higher ADR. So on average, like a four fifty versus a three seventy five, 
but you get into an urban location where like it's only about 9% of properties that have a pool, you're going to see a 40%, 46% higher ADR, 8% boost on occupancy. And then you compare a $400 ADR versus a $275 ADR. That's a big boost right there. Is that a pretty fair rule of thumb that scarcity with these amenities tends to drive the impact or in uplift in performance? And it can actually be scarcity either way. Because so let's talk about one where uh, something that's a whole lot more common. Um, and that's when you look in mountain locations and uh, hot tubs. So yes, overall in mountain locations, only about 15% of properties have it. But if you look in certain markets, like maybe in North Georgia or Gatlinburg, you're looking at 80, 90% of properties that have it. And so, yes, it's not something to really differentiate your property. But for those properties that don't have it, you still see that ADR boost because the properties that don't have it sort of have the ADR like lack of ADR or the, the penalty, ADR penalty of not having their hot tub. And it's still the biggest dif- differentiator uh, for mountain locations is hot tub where you get a 20% higher ADR, a 9% increase in occupancy. That's 34% increase in RevPAR. So if you think on every night that you make available of getting $212 versus $159, Mm -hmm. it doesn't take a long time to sort of pay for that uh, hot tub and see a positive uh, ROI. Is it fair to think the inverse is true as well? So let's say I just purchased a four bedroom in the Smokies and and it doesn't have a hot tub. Is it fair to think that I'm just not going to perform from an ADR standpoint equivalent to the market or perform below market if I don't imp- install a hot tub? So I wouldn't say you have to have one, but it's one of those differentiators that goes along with the sort of amenities that you're going to stack into the properties. Like if you've got a great view, large bedroom, game room, like the view could be your hot tub, right? Like the amazing game room could be your hot tub. Uh, but if you've got a property in the woods without a view, no space for a great uh, game room. Like maybe you got a, a fire pit. Like you might want to be looking at adding that hot tub as a way to differentiate your properties from from some of the others. Like in this time where we've seen so much supply grow, so much more competition. Like it's a great sort of stacking of amenities to give you that differentiation on top of versus uh, some of your competition. Makes a lot of sense because you could also have a pool and a hot tub and your view could be a parking lot. And you're probably not going to perform as well as a mountaintop property without a hot tub or a pool. And so yep. th- th- that comes back to what you said at the start here is we can give some directional insights and analysis on how certain amenities perform relative to the market and the uplift. But again, these variables move in tandem. And so it's important to think about the full picture here. And so then that leads me to my next question, Jamie, which is, if I'm sitting here and I'm looking at a new investment property, yep. I just want to know, Jamie, should I buy a hot tub for my property or not? How should I think through this and how should I conduct that analysis? The, the answer is always yes, Scott. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. All right. Done. <laughs> uh, no, but in reality, I mean, we, we should do an, an ROI analysis. I and mean, yes, you can go to the blog and sort of get a high level view, and that's going to give you rough averages for each. So, Like overall in the US, average RevPAR increase is about 35%, but that's going to vary. So if you want to do a rough rule of thumb, like go for it. But how I would do it and how I'm actually doing it for a property I'm looking to invest in now is I actually want to go in and sort of filter down to my city. And now I'm going to talk about how you can do it in the AirDNA app because we just released amenity filters uh, into the app for pro users and above which is super exciting. It's been something that is probably one of the most asked for feature releases that we've, <laughs> we've done of like, we've heard it. Why haven't you done this already? Like, <laughs> yes, let me, pause you, let me pause you there and restate that. We now have amenities filters in the app available for you to execute this analysis. Right. Uh, so uh, across the app, there's a variety of different uh, filters. Uh, so there's a new se- section as of, like last week, uh, that is now called uh, amenities. Uh, that it has like <laughs> essentially what you want it to do is you can filter to properties with and without 
that amenity. Uh, so for a market that I'd be looking to invest in, and these amenities hold across every section that you're in on our site. So if you're like on the sort of front page of their DNA app, you've got the list of cities, and you just want to filter to what are the markets with the highest ADRs for properties with pools? You can filter to properties with pools, sort the list of markets by ADR, and you've now got the cities with the top ADRs for properties with pools. Like a lot of fun to now start digging into analysis. So let's say I want to invest in, I'm looking at a property in Lake Tahoe. That's where you're looking to invest, right, Scott? Yeah, in the dream world, yes. <laughs> Uh, and I want to understand what the um, ADR impact and occupancy impact might be from uh, looking at properties with and without a uh, hot tub. So what I can do, click into Lake Tahoe. Let's say I want to um, uh, dive into that market. More than likely, you're going to have a sort of range of the property types uh, you're looking at. So let's say I want to understand for three bedroom, entire home, uh, house properties. So single family detached homes. I'm going to go ahead and run down those filters. Maybe like you you know that it's going to be a highly rated property. Like I want to get a little, lot of little low stuff. So look, maybe a four, eight and above. So bring down to I'm, a clean set of properties. You're going to probably have about 200 left. And now you can go into the occupancy and ADR section. And, and I actually think it's really important to do this at a month. And you can do it at the high level and see what the overall occupancy and ADR is as well. But one of the sort of superpowers of the app is you're going to actually be able to see what that impact is by season. Uh, so I would actually do it at the uh, monthly occupancy and ADR level. So click um, with a uh, uh, hot tub. So you're going to get your occupancy, you're going to ADR, you can uh, export that data to Excel. You can then do without a uh, hot tub, do the same thing, and then essentially run those numbers against each other, uh, compare each month relative um, with and without, and you're going to get what that occupancy and ADR premium is for that, that hot tub. And what you're going to see is it really matters or depends based on the season. You're going to see it really depends based on the market. Uh, like some areas, like if you're in Joshua Tree in the summer, like you're not probably getting the premium for the hot tub in Joshua Tree during the summer, like you are the pool. And then the opposite in the winter, like actually like Joshua Tree is a great spot to go to in the winter. And people really want to book it with a hot tub uh, or in North Georgia mountains. Like I, mean, it may not matter as much during the summer, when so much hiking and fun things to do, but in the winter, if you want to continue to drive occupancy, that's when you need that amenity to help you sort of, and that's when the boost really happens is during certain cities when that amenity really matters. So you now have this assessment. You can get the data on the revenue or top line impact, but that's only part of the equation. Yep. So what would you do next? So now I would understand how much that amenity is going to cost me. And there's two parts of that analysis. There's just the sort of purchase price. And let's let's throw an insulation in there because you're probably not going to install <laughs> it yourself. There might be some plumbing. There might be, uh, you might have to change like an electrical outlet, like the 220 version versus the 110, like actually makes a big difference on how quickly you can heat and all else held equal, like go for the 220 version. You're probably going to regret, regret that. And that's um, and on the voltage. Uh, and then it's the ongoing maintenance because there is some additional cleaning. There is some additional sort of cost with having some of these amenities. For some, like a pool, is going to be significant, uh, especially if you're going to allow for heating or cooling of that pool, which um, you might decide to charge extra for, might not. But that expense is going to have to be ongoing expense and included in sort of the ROI cal calculation. You might have to change your cleaning fee knowing that your cleaners are going to charge you an extra 25, 50 bucks per turn to clean and refill that hot tub. And then sort of get to what is that estimated annual increase in your revenue? What is that initial and ongoing expense? And then how long is it going to take you to actually re re recoup that expense? Uh, and if we get to a ROI where you're going to be, I knowing you're going to be operating this property, 
and like where you get an ROI within like two or three years, like that for me screams like, all right, this is something I'm going to do. If it's like, I've got to operate this property for 10 years to get a return, like eh, you, 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 you might uh, say like, it, it probably won't be worth it. And what I'm hearing here, Jamie, is do the research. The tools are available, but be willing to dig and, and look at it. Look at the information at, at your fingertips here. So maybe as we, as we conclude, we've talked about some of the big ones, the pool, the hot tub. We saw washers and dryers actually emerge as carrying an ADR lift as well. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to divert this a little bit and say beyond maybe those traditional amenities, we're seeing some trends emerge in alternative amenities. And some of these are lower lift from a capital or investment standpoint up front, but guests are still wanting. So mm -hmm. some that jump out, you know, smart home devices, so smart technology, outdoor spaces, maybe even a workspace. So just a desk, you know, people are traveling and working from these Airbnbs now, family friendly features, anything that you're seeing in the data that jumps out here, either from a demand standpoint or an amenities supply standpoint. Yeah. And there's definitely the ones that you mentioned of like, if you don't have Wi-Fi and now we're living in a much more sort of remote type working environment and kids and their devices, like maybe 10, 15 years ago, it was like nice to not have Wi-Fi. And, and, but now it's not like, <laughs> unless you're specifically going on, like, this is an off grid property. That's right. Uh, um, and there is a sort of demand for that. There is a market uh, there, but having I mean, decent Wi-Fi. Uh, that parts of the house like is sort of expected now having TV, uh, having this sort of basic setup around and that people can log into their smart TV accounts. I think it is great now that there is the expectation around cable and you don't have to necessarily have that hundred dollar subscription for cable, just have a fire stick and have allow people to sort of log into their, their accounts. And there's uh, sort of different expectations there now that, and then what we didn't, get into, but maybe it's on part two of this analysis. It's sort of over the top amenities. And I would love for people to send us what the sort of over a top amenity is that they'd love for us to analyze, whether it's pickleball courts, bowling alleys, game rooms. Um, like what is the most outlandish amenities that you've sort of seen out there? Uh, and we'll send them to us and we'll try to- We'll uh, bring you on. We lists. will bring you on an interview to understand how you arrived at this decision and how it's performing. I, I'm really curious to see what, what the output is here. I'm going to make one last plug for what I actually deem is the highest ROI amenity. An amenity may be a loose term, but it'll cost you $40. String lights. Oh, yeah. I've heard put, that so many times. Put string lights out back. Mm -hmm. People love string lights. It makes your book, your listing more attractive and marketable to get people to book. People love the outdoor space and it creates another opportunity for people to gather out back. Um, it's like another living area. So I put these in all of my properties and immediately saw the benefit. And that's my final plug. If you made it this far in the episode, that's, that's a little treat. <laughs> well, Scott, this was a nice, fun, uh, short, sweet episode. Thank you so much for diving into the land of amenities with me. As always, Jamie, really appreciate it. Yeah.